Good afternoon. You know we're going to do this again. You know I'm a call and response kind of person. Good afternoon. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Joan Reed. I'm Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership. And it is my privilege um, for our office, Diversity, uh, Inclusion, and Community Partnership, to collaborate with the Center for the History of Medicine, the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, and the Center for Bioethics on our series, Reflections on Medicine, Racism, and Society. In many ways, these collaborations date back actually prior to 2011, okay. when our offices considered how to use the then upcoming sesquicentennial of the Civil War to consider historical relationship among medicine, war, racism, and equity. We've come a long way together um, since that time and medical historiography um, itself has come a long way since then. And in this respect, we are joined today by Dr. Jim Downs, um, playing a central role in driving that historiography forward. It's thus my privilege to honor Dr. Downs back to Harvard. He is the Gilder uh, Lerman National Endowment for the Humanities Professor of Civil War Era Studies and History at Gettysburg College. And having earned his BA in American Literature at Penn and his Master's in American Studies and his PhD in History at Columbia, Dr. Downs would author such work as 2012's Sick from Freedom, African-American Sickness and Suffering During the Civil War and Reconstruction, 2016 Stand By Me, The Forgotten History of Gay Liber Liberation, as well as uh, what we'll especially hear about today, 2021's Maladies of Empire, How Colonialism, Slavery, and War Transform Medicine. Dr. Downs has edited four anthologies, is a series editor of Civil War History, co and is co-series editor with Catherine Clinton of History in the Headlines, has written numerous articles for popular audiences and publications such as The Atlanta, New Yorker, and The New York Times, in recognition of such work, he's been elected to the Society of American Historians, the Royal Historical Society in the United Kingdom, and the Executive Council for the Southern Historical Association. Along the way, he's actually spent two terms here at Harvard in 2015 to 16 as an Andrew Mellon New Directions Fellow, gaining postgraduate, postgraduate training in medical anthropology in 2022-23 as a Sheila Biddle Ford Foundation Fellow at the Hutchins Center for African American History, African and African American History. Dr. Downs' works have examined crucial gaps in our history and historiography. Sick from Freedom explored the catastrophic health aftermath of the Civil War and emancipation and the attempts and often failures to provide health care to the formerly enslaved in the country. In that work, we do find some individuals attempting to make sense of the cause and spread of disease. And in Maladies of Empire, Dr. Downs looks more broadly at the ways that colonialism, slavery, and war, including the Civil War, critically shaped such understanding. He examines not only sites, often far from cities like London or Boston, that have been ignored, but especially the lives and voices of those being counted and questioned that have been to this point ignored. As we've uh, conventionally related the history of epidemiology. So for the series that started with an examination of the relationship among medicine, war, racism, and equity, we couldn't have a more appropriate or distinguished speaker than Dr. Uh, today. And we're grateful to have Dr. Downs in this conversation with us as we continue our series on reflections on medicine, racism, and society. And with this, I'd like to turn the podium over to Dr. Downs. So uh, thank you so much for that very warm introduction. I also wanna thank Scott and Renee, whose Herculean efforts helped to bring me here today. I'm really um, grateful and honored to present my research. So. For the first slide, I'm actually going to read it because it's the major thesis of the book. And then from that point forward, I'm going to be off the cuff. But I just want 
everyone. I just want to make sure that I cover the main argument of the presentation today. So I argue in Maladies of Empire that colonialism, slavery, and war create a built environment, slave ships, plantations, battlefields, and other spaces that enabled physicians to visualize the spread of infectious disease. This led to an unprecedented proliferation of case studies that provided the foundation for epidemiology. I chart this development with, with the beginning of the fields of chemistry in the mid 1750s, studies of air and ventilation, to the creation of the first ever International Sanitary Commission that developed in 1866. My research reveals how doctors moved away from thinking of supernatural forces or miasma theory as the, as the cause of disease and began to investigate the spread of epidemics, which led to the field of epidemiology. So that's the sort of general argument and overview of the talk today. The research for this book began when I was working on my first book, Sick from Freedom, um, which explains the health conditions of formerly enslaved people. Most people recognize, most Civil War historians recognize that the Civil War was the largest biological crisis of the 19th century. More soldiers died from disease than they did from battle. Estimates um, tabulate something like three out of five soldiers died from what was called in 19th century nomenclature camp diseases. And camp diseases could range from pneumonia to dysentery to smallpox to other forms of infectious disease. Meanwhile, Black people liberated themselves from plantation slavery, and they entered into an environment, into an environment that was pillaged by disease. Historians have often, and for good reason, focused on the triumphant ending of slavery and the rise of the Reconstruction Amendment that led to citizenship and suffrage. But in their efforts to portray robust political black people as robust political agents, they have overlooked the epidemiological consequences of war. And so my work in this book was to essentially chart what were the health conditions that black people faced and to reveal that close to one million black people were sick or died during uh, the transition from slavery to freedom. In trying to tell that history, I reconstructed a smallpox epidemic, which had otherwise not yet been part of medical historiography or part of the history of the Civil War. And I studied how and why smallpox broke out. And there's lots of reasons for why smallpox during this period broke out. In large part, the Civil War happens before the advent of germ theory when doctors really understand what the causative agents are that cause the outbreak of disease. Furthermore, when black people were emancipated from slavery, and this is a part of US history that hasn't really been emphasized, they were forced into refugee camps and they were crowded into environments that were adjacent to military camps where they often suffered from malnutrition, lack of shelter and clean clothing, which further intensified the spread of illness and for an epidemic like smallpox, which at least in the 19th century could be controlled a little bit through quarantine, they were not even quarantined during this period. So what, what I began to sort of question was not only how did the disease spread, but why it, why it was spreading. The federal government at that time didn't necessarily see itself as responsible for the health care of ordinary citizens. But this changed in 1865 with the creation of the first ever medical hospital system in the country, which established 40 hospitals in the South, uh, provided uh, medical care to over a million people, and employed over 120 doctors. What was really interesting about this moment was the federal government would say that they didn't have the manpower or the resources to respond to the outbreak of smallpox. And so when I was looking at these records, some of this actually would make sense to me because how would the government get resources from Washington DC to Streetport, Louisiana or to newborn North Carolina? I recognize that there were obviously limitations in the 19th century that could in many ways um, taught the spread of medical care to people in need. But then as I continued to do my research, I uncovered that a cholera pandemic blew up. It began in Asia, it spread throughout Europe into, from, from Asia to Russia, 
to Europe, across the Atlantic, made its way into Canada, down into New York, and to the post-war South. And all of a sudden, the federal government, which claimed that they didn't have the manpower resources to stop the spread of smallpox, developed an efficacious protocol to control cholera. Now, in the 19th century, smallpox was a very well-known epidemic, and people understood how to control it, mostly through quarantine. Cholera was relatively new. So when I concluded the book, I essentially argued that there was medical racism in part to blame for why the federal government didn't respond to smallpox, largely because they blamed it on, on ideas about black inferiority, they didn't provide enough medical care. But when it came to cholera, the federal government developed an efficacious protocol that distributed um, guidelines to doctors throughout the entire United States on what they imagined was the cause of why cholera was spreading. It was in the water to various sanitary protocols to help prevent the spread of cholera. So when I ended that book, I, I, I made that argument, but I was still really curious, how was it possible that the US federal government was able to develop the necessary protocol to control cholera. And so I wanted to know a little bit more about how epidemiology as a field originated. So this is just a little bit more of this kind of illustrations you saw during the post-war South and the reasons why they spread. I just was talking too quickly and I skipped the slide. It's okay, it happens, okay. Um, 19th century definitions of epidemiology typically refer to the study of how disease spreads across a population and how to control and prevent epidemics. So this is basically how they're using the term um, in the 19th century. The cholera pandemic affects most parts of the, the, the world. And what I wanted to do was to go to London where um, doctors had basically traced the outbreak of cholera to a water pump. And so some of you, I hope, are familiar with the story of, of Jon Snow. And so sort of in a nutshell, uh, a cholera outbreak um, erupts in a poor section in London and Snow begins a major investigation to uncover why it spreads. And what he notices is that his um, findings about uh, morbidity and mortality contradict the prevalent ideas at the time, mostly ideas about contagion and miasma. So in terms of contagion, it would argue, he would go and knock on each door of a particular household and find out everyone in one household was sick, then everyone in the adjacent household wasn't, then the next household only two people were sick, and the next household only one. So he couldn't understand if contagion was actually a theory, why in fact was it not, why, why, why weren't all of these people sick? Secondly, he did post-mortem evaluations on the body, and at that particular time, if people believed in miasma theory, which basically just postulates that when you have corpse or trash, it leads to poisonous vapors that emanate from the body. People breathe in these poisonous vapors and they become sick. When he did the postmortem evaluations, he recognized that there was no sort of damage to the lungs, but there was damage to the GI tract. So ultimately through an investigative method, he traced the spread of cholera to a water pump. He basically noticed that all of the people who were suffering from cholera lived within proximity to the water pump and then became sick. This then becomes the founding story of how epidemiology begins. And in many respects, um, it's part of most textbooks on the origin of public health. But to me, I was I went into the archive, I started to do research on the spread of infectious disease in 1850s, and I soon realized that the story of Jon Snow was sort of plucked out as the sort of major sort of pioneer and hero of the history of epidemiology at the expense of not only excluding legions of other doctors who were studying infectious disease, but more important, but more importantly, sorry, we have to go stage left, I'm sorry, I, I worked with Janet Jackson in the 90s on stage, so I'm pretty good with stage direction. I did the control tour. Um, so, okay, so just stay here. Okay, so just stay within the flowers. Stay within the flowers. Okay, got it. Okay. All right, got it. I, really, I apologize. No, it's totally fine. I got it. So, 
ultimately, John Snow's the sort of founding, the founding father of epidemiology. My research wanted to investigate um, how and why this developed and what else we know about the sort of the story of, um, of, of, the, of epidemiology. So ultimately, the missing link in the story of epidemiology is the epidemiological society. This was an, an organization comprised of British physicians who were deployed throughout the British Empire to India, to the Caribbean, to parts of Africa to study the spread of infectious disease. When they were in these foreign environments, they developed theories about what caused disease and also how to control it. When they returned to the metropole, they began to sort of think of themselves as experts. And so the notion or the field of epidemiology begins with the creation of this society that capitalizes on the expertise that these various doctors gained as a result of their work throughout the British Empire. At this point in the talk, you could say to your, you, yourself, Downs, okay, so is this just a lateral move? You're going from snow just to a legion of other doctors. But instead, as a historian, I wanted to probe more deeply into the case studies that these doctors developed in order to understand how they got their expertise. And what I uncovered were the ways in which colonialism and slavery create built environments that allowed these physicians to begin to study the spread of disease across various populations. When epidemics broke out in France or in the UK, doctors were often caught up in the drama of those epidemics and they often had to treat patients. Colonialism provided them with a bird's eye view they were able to step away from the epidemic. They were able to get a better sense of how it was spreading and they had the time and also more importantly, as I explained in the book, the bureaucracy to help create a sub-regime of knowledge production that would ultimately allow them to develop new understandings of epidemiology. Prior to the 19th century, there were certainly doctors in the Ottoman Empire and parts of Asia even in antiquity, that were studying the spread of disease. But military bureaucracy creates not only a network that connects these doctors throughout large parts of the world, but it also creates a system of record keeping that takes their various theories and observations and codifies it into an idea that can then be sent back to the UK. So what I've noticed was, so for example, Snow's major findings are happening in the 1840s, late 1840s and the early 1850s. Meanwhile, a doctor by the name of Gavin Milvoy is sent by the British Crown to Jamaica. In Jamaica, he needs to investigate why and how cholera is spreading throughout the island. And what military bureaucracy provides him is with the opportunity of having doctors stationed throughout all of this region and for each of these doctors or military officials to then send reports back to him, noting not only morbidity and mortality rates, but also noting various protocols that they employed that they found efficacious in controlling the spread of the epidemic and also providing different types of ideas they had around, sanita around sanitation, which also could um, ameliorate the, the situation. What then happens is these reports all flow back to Milvoy in a very systematic way that provides him with a bird's eye view of the spread of infection across the entire, across the entire country. He then can take that um, information and then send it back to a leading medical supervisor in London who's not only getting a snapshot of what's happening in terms of cholera spread in Jamaica, but a similar bureaucratic process is happening in India and in parts of Africa. So the field of epidemiology is beginning to develop in the early 1850s as a result of the work of doctors stationed throughout the world who are sending back their synthetic reports to the metropole, who are now able to, uh, who, to the metropole where 
more officials can process that material and then get a better sense of the spread of, of disease. What's also important with um, Milvoy's study is that he not only does an analysis of the study of cholera uh, within Jamaica, but colonialism and the sort of British military provide him with direct access to doctors in the Spanish Caribbean, the French Caribbean, and even the southeastern part of the United States. The military bureaucracy then provides a broader global snapshot of the spread of epidemics as a, as a result of the ways in which these various officials are stationed here. So we can think about what happened in the early days of COVID, that all of a sudden epidemiologists were able to get immediate snapshots of the outbreak of COVID in Iran, in Italy, in New York City. That pattern of record keeping and reporting it to a central authority who would then digest the material and take an epidemiological portrait of it develops as a result of military um, protocol. So John Snow's sort of investigation into the study of cholera in a poor section of London was not just a simple pioneering effort, but he was following in the steps of colonial doctors who had begun various investigations that were happening throughout the world. More importantly, John Snow was a member of the London Epidemiological Society, where Gavin Milroy was the president. So again, what we have done within the history of epidemiology is to take a snapshot of one figure and to canonize him. And this is not to in any way, and I want to make this point really clear, this is not to discredit Snow's theory and it's not to discredit what Snow did, but it's to place Snow in context. And then it's to ask an even more important question. How did a doctor like Milroy gain the ability to take a snapshot of health conditions in, in colonial uh, Jamaica? And part of this was a result of the sort of violence of colonialism and imperialism. That is to say, when doctors and military officials go into areas that are populated mostly by, by 1850 um, newly emancipated slaves and other poor and marginalized people, it's the sort of power of military of the military behind them that allows them to enter into people's homes, to begin question to begin questioning people about their sanitary practices, and also to gain insight about health. So the field of epidemiology is not only a result of these doctors who are deployed across the British Empire, but it's also about the ways in which the military has this sort of power to sort of um, control a population in order to extract data from it. Um, I'm now going to sort of turn to a sort of case study to better provide um, evidence of how these doctors were not only um, creating a network that helped to facilitate knowledge about epidemiology, but how they were drawing specifically on the knowledge of local enslaved and colonized people to help theorize about the spread of disease. And so I'm going to go to Cape Verde, which is located here, right outside the West Coast of Africa, where a major yellow fever epidemic breaks out in 1846. What happens is a British ship known as the Eclair is sent by the British government to police the coast um, of West Africa to Sierra Leone because there's news reports that, that certain um, individuals are involved in the illegal slave trade. And so the British government tries to amass a police force on the ship to go to this area to find any um, criminal activity. And a lot of the men who join up are promised if they do in fact, if they do in fact find people who were illegally buying and selling enslaved Africans, they will receive a huge reward. So they cruise up and down the coast of West Africa around Sierra Leone for any evidence of criminal activity and they don't find any. They're frustrated and so they have to return back to the UK. On their way back, they stop um, in Cape Verde on these islands that in the late 1840s are under Portuguese control. 
when they arrive um, to Cape Verde, um, what's customary during this period is that the washerwomen um, walk onto the ship to take soiled linens to clean the clothing. So a group of washerwomen, most of whom are black and some of whom are enslaved, they're all under colonial rule. They take the soiled garments, they launder them, they provide them for the, the men for when they go back on their voyage home. Meanwhile, the men um, are frustrated that they're not gonna get a huge reward. They go and they have a huge party. They try to have fun. Three to five of them are still missing as of um, yesterday. Um, so we still don't. <laughs> so eventually the ship um, goes, goes back to return to um, the UK and right before it's about to dock, a yellow fever epidemic blows up on the ship, which immediately triggers a major quarantine debate. Now I understand you're, this is a medical audience, but when I was writing the book, this particular section was before COVID and I, I had quarantine in the title and my editor said, you, you can't use quarantine, no one's gonna know about it. And they're not gonna understand any of this or the threat, so anyway. What happens is there's a huge debate in London about the health of the economy versus the health of the people. And there are mer certain merchants are basically saying that we absolutely have to quarantine the ship because if our trading partners in France and Spain find out that we, that we didn't, they'll never want to trade with us. And then others said, if they find out we have cholera or any type of infectious disease like yellow fever, they're never gonna wanna trade with us. So it leads to this huge dilemma about what to do with these people on the ship. And so it makes headlines um, throughout the UK. And this is an important footnote to the Jon Snow story. Jon Snow was reading about these accounts. He knew about this major debate around, around infectious disease. But uh, what I will show today is that even though the theories about the spread of yellow fever in the mid 19th century proved to be inaccurate, this moment leads to the creation of a set of investigative methods that provides the bedrock for epidemiology. And this is what Snow eventually drew on when he goes into a poor section in London. So they send a doctor by the name of John McWilliam from the British, from London to go to Cape Verde to investigate the spread of, the, of, of this disease because they need to know whether or not it originated from Africa because there's conceptions that these tropical environments produce disease or if it could actually spread in the UK. Now, this is a part of the research I'm just gonna tell for the historians of the room because it was sort of fascinating for me. I started going to the archives um, in London in 2011 before Sick From Freedom um, came out, my first book, because I had this question about how did epidemiology as a field begin? And I would go and I would spend time at the Welcome and at the National Archives in Kew. And normally I would have to fly overnight. I would arrive like, in the morning, before I would even check into my hotel, I would go to the archives to fill out anything I wanted to see in the rare book rooms. You had to fill out a, a slip and they rush back and they get it and they come back in two hours. So at one point I arrive at the welcome, I put in my request and then I'm jet lagged, I'm tired, I want a cappuccino, I want to go down to the cafe, maybe have some cake, like, but something tells me to just, you know, meander around the open stacks. And they actually look like this. Like, it, in other words, there's the rare books that are sealed behind, you know, a, a, a vault. But then there's a lot of stuff that's just open for anyone to look at. So I ended up pulling this um, anthology off the shelf. Uh, it was completely serendipitous. And I open it up. And what I find is this report. And when I begin flipping through the report, I see all of these questions about um, disease spread and infection. And I notice, and I don't know if you're gonna be able to see the names, but they'll have the name, this woman's name is Johanna. And it says, and this is 19th century nomenclature, they refer to her as a mulatto and a native of San Antonio, and she's 59 years old. And I thought, well, wait a minute, San Antonio. So I go back and I flip back to the front page and I think, okay, it says 1847. Is it a reprint? I couldn't understand. I didn't at that point know that San Antonio was part of Cape Verde. And I had studied 
the health conditions of black people for over 10 years. And in order to tell that history, I was often piecing together fragments in the archive, a newspaper article, a line in a pension record, two sentences in a military report. I never found an epidemiological report that actually provided a transcription of the testimonies of actual patients describing everything from the incubation period to symptoms to the spread of disease. I was literally sort of sort of blown away by this. So um, I immediately turned my attention to on trying to understand what this document was and how I could um, how it could influence my study. What I ultimately concluded was that McWilliam interviewed all of the washerwomen who went aboard the ship. They had no idea that three months later, a physician would come to interview them. But they had copious details regarding the incubation period, where it spread, where they, who was infected, who was not infected. They all articulated the same sort of hallmark of yellow fever, which is, yellow, which is the black vomit. And he took all of this information from these washerwomen in order to develop the methods for epidemiology. That is to say, these women were in many respects, yikes, these women were in many respects the first contact tracers. They were, um, as washerwomen on the ship, they had a very keen sense of who was infected in what household. They had a very keen sense of the incubation period, of the various symptoms, and they even knew the morbidity and mortality rates. So I took this document, I wrote this chapter, and I sat it down and I had to work on other parts of the book. I go into other parts of the book, and it's a year or two later, and another historian starts writing about the quarantine debate in Cape Verde, he will remain nameless, Mark Harrison. And ultimately, <laughs> I look at his book and I thought, oh no, he's found this before, before I have it. Now, this is a real important moment to think about how historians can look at the same piece of evidence but derive it two different um, arguments. For him, the whole episode in Cape Verde and this particular ship illuminated a broader question about quarantine and contagion. For me, it illuminated the ways in which dispossessed populations of people actually produced knowledge that led to the foundation of epidemiology. His book is absolutely essential and important, so I'm not trying to discredit it. But when I was thinking about it, I was like, why did I not come to that interpretation that he did? And why am I taking these women who ultimately, even though we have a paragraph of them, they only appear on one page in a particular document. So as a historian, he didn't have enough evidence to actually talk about them, but I felt like I had to take these women who were on the margins and flip the script and make them into being the principal actors of the story. And part of what I did and part of my thought process was why did I make that move? And I started to think about, as the introduction mentioned, my early training, which was in literature, and it was in how Black feminist scholars in the 1980s and 1990s were basically told that, their, that Black women's literature didn't matter in the face of Western canon, Shakespeare, Poe, Hawthorne. That these Black women writers, Hazel Carby, later Sadia Hartman, Toni Morrison, Evelyn Hammonds, among others, began this process of finding these marginal representations of Black women in Western literature and flipping the script and saying, we might not have a lot of information about them, but we need to take these clues, these utterances, and these reference and use them in order to rethink how we talk about the past. And so that theoretical intervention was very useful for me and how I read the medical documents. That is to say, the mere presence of black women on a page left me with so many questions. I didn't know, I knew their age, but I knew nothing else about them. As a social historian, I was almost trained to sort of dismiss it because I don't have enough information, but this theoretical intervention 
um, gave me the sort of confidence to say, you can sort of turn these people as in, into principal actors in order to retell the history of epidemiology. And so when I looked further into telling this history, I began to notice that the presence of Black people were always there, but it has been in some ways purposely omitted and on the margins. So the actual report that's produced provides copious detail of these people, but when people talk about quarantine and they talk about contagion, Africa typically appears as this mysterious place which either causes these tropical diseases or doesn't cause it. That's where the debate kind of pivots without recognizing the fact that these pe local people on the ground had their own theories and their own theories weren't just circulating among themselves, but they're, they're their theories actually became codified and reproduced in official documents and in official discussions. So that when we think about Jon Snow and the story of how cholera originated, these women's testimonies were part of it, but they weren't articulated in the same way that you can look at Shakespeare's um, Othello and the presence, the haunting presence of people of color, both directly and indirectly in that. So when I decided to um, say that the field of epidemiology begins in 1850, and I saw these doctors coming from 1840, from work that they did in the 1840s, the 1830s, and eventually taking that expertise to create this professional organization in 1850, I wanted to know, well, when did it, did it start earlier? Did it start sooner than 1850? And I went back in time and I could see that, I want to walk left, but I can't. Okay, so I don't be, so, all right, so 1850, 1840, 1830, 1820, 1790, I'm still finding examples within military bureaucracy of doctors drawing on this major new network and the power of the bureaucracy to track the spread of disease. When I see a major turning point develop is in 1750 with the creation of the field of chemistry, which coincides with understandings of ventilation and air, which seem to be the cornerstone of public health. And the 18th century story, and I'll tell it in a nutshell, that is to say, doctors in the 18th century began to understand the importance of circulation and ventilation because of a story they heard about what happened in Calcutta. Now, quick footnote, of course, since Aristotle, since even before Aristotle, human beings understood the necessity of air for survival. What happens in 1750 is that there are studies by chemists um, in London and in Paris and in Germany where doctor or scientists are basically showing how new, they're looking at the ways in which air changes quality as a result of being placed in certain devices. And they're looking at also how plants emanate air and they're capturing those gases in troughs. And so ultimately by the mid 18th century, oxygen gets theorized by scientists in various parts of Europe who are able to demonstrate how air changes its quality in the laboratory. In Calcutta, this particular example shows what that means, how air changes its quality and what it means for human survival. And so British prisoners of war are crowded into a jail cell. They are begging the guard for water. To make a very long story short, the guard agrees and starts pouring water into um, their hats and passes it through the small opening, the small window. They allow their major supervising official, their number one in command, to drink the water. He does not feel relieved at all. He then just accidentally walks underneath the window where he then feels completely rejuvenated. So this point, which it seems so natural and so obvious to us, begins to crystallize this, um, the necessity of ventilation and the necessity of fresh air. Throughout um, most of the history of medicine, the history of science, the stories of ventilation typically accompany larger narratives about industrialization and larger narratives about the poor. My argument is that the ideas about ventilation 
that become a hallmark to epidemiology begin on slave ships. And so what I'm going to show in the remainder of this period is how oxygen um, is a concept that is developed and theorized within laboratories, but actually becomes realized on plantations. I mean, I'm sorry, on slave ships. This um, is known as the Brook slave ship. It is um, often represented in history textbooks because it was used by abolitionists to show the horrific conditions of enslaved Africans who are depicted as being crammed and crowded into the bottom of the ships. A story that's not often told is the story of, Tom, of Dr. Thomas Trotter, who is um, on this ship. He goes to the bottom of the ship and realizes that the captains are not fulfilling the protocol of having the enslaved Africans go to the top of the deck and walk around and dance for exercise in order to get fresh air. So what he then does is he writes about this sort of crowded, confined conditions that led to massive suffocation and skyrocketed morbidity and mortality rates. When I was doing research, I found in The Lancet, which was the leading medical journal of the 19th century, that doctors were still citing Thomas Trotter's work in order to show that air changed its quality on slave ships. So what I then realized was that was one particular case and I wasn't so sure. And my editor at Harvard University Press um, said, I need some more evidence. And so I found more evidence. And when I found more evidence, this will, it broke my heart. Maybe I'll let it break your heart. She said, now it has to go back out for peer review. So here's, <laughs> and I already got the letter from the syndicate at Harvard that said, we're ready to publish it. So this is actually, they knew that what I was about to show you was a sort of an electrifying find and they wanted it to go through one more round, which I'm glad it did. So ultimately what happens is I found more evidence of the slave ships. And what I uncovered was a guy by the name of Stephen Hales, who's well known throughout the history of medicine and science creates ventilators. And he creates ventilators that are mechanically run at the bottom of ships in order to promote circulation. Now, in order for him to prove the efficacy of ventilators, he starts to collect he starts to collect reports from the captains of slave ships who then tell him that their morbidity and mortality rates decrease dramatically once they run the actual ventilators and enslaved Africans, become, their voices become used in order to solidify the creation of this brand new technology which is at the heart of ventilation and the cornerstone of public health. So I'll just give you, the book has many more examples, but I'll just give you one. Um, I was informed that in a Liverpool ship, which had ventilators, not one of the 800 slaves died, except only a child born. Um, he further added that in several other slave ships without ventilators, there died 30, 40, 50, or 60 in a ship. So what you're beginning to sort of see are the ways in which the slave ships provided case studies that proved the efficacy of the ventilators, but also began to crystallize ideas about oxygen. So when we go back to this idea of the periodic table, we often see the periodic table as completely divorced from the transatlantic slave trade as not part at all to do with slavery, but in fact, we can see that oxygen becomes a major element on the periodic table as a result of what's happening in terms of hails. Now, one of the interesting things that happens, and I won't go too deep into this, is that in the early drafts of Hale's um, reports, he actually mentioned slaves. So this is also important in terms of the history of science. Slavery is, 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 is named, it is recognized as an important case study to advance these theories. As he moves along, when you get to his um, most, most recent um, and widely cited uh, polished treatise, um, the word slave sort of disappears. And so all you see is the word ships. So if I, as a historian of medicine, were to investigate how and when 
did ventilators begin, the word slavery is not there. It was only because I sort of excavated the early drafts that I saw that the case studies were actually enslaved people. So the question is, and this is a question for you to think about, and I have my own sort of uh, uh, theories about it, but why does slavery then begin to disappear from the record? Now you could look at this particular case as a one offers. So this is just an exceptional case. It wasn't intended, but if you think about this in the context of Cape Verde and you think about it in terms of the next example, you see an actual pattern where doctors and scientists at the time depended on colonized and enslaved people, but ultimately their contribution gets scrubbed clean from the record. So I mentioned um, early on that Dr. Trotter was on the, uh, on the Brooks. And when he was on the Brooks, he testified it to Parliament. And his, his, his testimony led to the, um, the slave trade being abolished. Um, he talked about how the crowded conditions were leading to um, in, intense mor morbidity and mortality. He also noted that there was an outbreak of scurvy, which is a result of, as you know, malnutrition. And so he was really sort of curious about why and how um, people were suffering from scurvy. And by this point in the 18th century, there's lots of theories as a result of what they called animal meat, too much wine, did you need to have vegetables? There's theories, but nothing has yet been codified. So when, um, let's see, when um, Tr Trotter arrives to Antigua, he's headed for Jamaica, a black woman, and I'm not sure if she's enslaved or I'm not sure if she's free, she walks onto the ship and she provides the enslaved population with citrus fruit. He then um, and she encourages them to eat it. He then conducts an experiment. So again, thinking about how does slavery create the conditions for him to now test a theory which is circulating in Europe about the cause of scurvy. Now he has all of these participants available. So what he does is he divides, he divides uh, a group of nine Africans with symptoms of scurvy into groups of three and gave limes to one group, guavas to a second, and ripe guavas to a third. After a week, those who had eaten the ripe guavas had not improved while the others were almost well. He noticed that when the enslaved Africans directly sucked the juices from the citrus fruit, they improved by the time the ship arrived in Jamaica. He then goes back to his advisor, and this is where I kind of really started to relate to him. He tells his advisor back, because he was studying in Edinburgh, and he knocks on his door, he goes in and he says, listen, I know that it's citrus fruit, which is the cure of scurvy. And his advisor says, no, it's, I'm just gonna go back to Lind. I'm not <laughs> dismissing you. I don't care about your theory. And he went and gave his lecture anyway. Um, Trotter was intrepid. He nevertheless published his study. Um, it was published in London, republished in Germany, and then again, published in Philadelphia. What's interesting is when he goes to publish it, his case study were enslaved Africans on a slave ship. The language he uses is a multitude of cases, based on a multitude of cases. So he uses empirical language that describes a clinical experience that erases slavery from the process of knowledge production. So again, if you were to just read his treatise, it would say a multitude of cases, you're not thinking about it. But it's only in tracing his life and tracing where he was, do we actually realize that the test subjects were enslaved people. So when it comes to sort of uncovering the history of epidemiology and the methods that are actually undergirding the policies that are guiding us through pandemics even today, we need to sort of think about the various subjects whose lives, whose ideas, and whose knowledge help to shape these major scientific um, inventions. So for the rest of the book, and I won't get into this, I'm just going to end on that note, but I also look at incarcerated people, Muslims returning from the Hajj, who were placed in Malta and other parts in, in Egypt, um, and who were quarantined, whose um, bodies were investigated for any sign of cholera, and who were then um, used as a way to show that cholera was not 
contagious and that quarantine was actually, hold on to it, an antiquated policy. This is the thing. 19th century scientists saw quarantine as problematic. It's not something that was popular during COVID when people would call me and say, well, what did they say in the 19th century? I'm like, you don't want to know. Um, <laughs> so there's Civil War soldiers and prisoners. Okay, so that's it. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions. Do we sit? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So thanks so much. I'm, I'm uh, Scott Podolsky. I uh, direct the Center for the History of Medicine and part of our part of Global Health and Social Medicine I'm with Alan Grant, Rebecca Randell, and Dean Reed. We're really proud to co host this right. series. Thank you. Good to have you here today. Thank you. Um, and I was just say, you know, fascinating refocusing of our attention on people who have been at best ignored and worst erased from history. Right. So really grateful to you. Um, for folks who are online, we're actually uh, monitoring the Q&A, so feel free to uh, <clears throat> provide your questions via the Q&A function. Otherwise, everyone here in the room, certainly feel free to raise your hand. Um, I, it's, it's fascinating to get to hear how you, you were able to recapture the lives of, of folks who have been considered at best as objects and have them as subjects or use the words agents or actors in your story. Right. The one case you found by serendipity, how, how do we do this going forward to, 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 to relocate these histories? So this is something that I think about all of the time and the, all of those, and I have this in the ch chapter two of my book, um, those people all appear in a very qualitative, um, descriptive way within 19th century medical journals. I think it's the advent of germ theory and microbiology and more sophisticated understandings of disease that ultimately um, reduce the subjectivity to a uh, statistic. But those, if you go to late 18th century, 19th century, that subjectivity is all over the place. And I, I talk about in cases of, with, you know, the washerwomen are a huge part of chapter four and of Cape Verde. And I thought, well, again, maybe this is just an anomaly. But then when I would look at the records um, in India and in Egypt, um, again, the washerwomen are mentioned, in fact, even in Malta as well, um, because people at the time want to debate contagion. They recognize that contagion theory is not telling us everything that we think it's telling us. So the example would be, if, if this ship is in fact contagious, why is it that when the washerwoman goes onto the ship, she comes back and she's not sick? If the in India, if these people are, uh, if this if cholera is contagious, why is it? And they actually name the the Indian men who wash the beds and wash the patients. Why are they? And they name them sick. And so what I was doing was because I was trained out of literature, I was saying, wow, this subjectivity is amazing. How can I build on that? How can I emphasize it? So they actually are, they're hiding in, they're hiding in plain sight almost. Yeah. Yeah, go um, Thank you so much. That was a great talk. Um, and I was really struck in the example with the limes and guavas. Yeah. That the enslaved people specifically wanted the unripe ones. Right. Is there any further information about whether they knew consciously or well, he gave them that yeah or, i don't know i mean what that it had been observed yeah that, that he's throwing out the ripe one right right before. so right so, so it's it's again it's 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 un, it's unclear but that's also part of it is that what i want to sort of acknowledge is we have this understanding about citrus fruit how did we get there and they were making decisions on the ground yeah and that's how we got there on some level at least in this particular case it almost looks like they already they are the right and so some of this i mean this is this is a I, I think a fundamental i mean i always just so i'm fascinated by this but then i also want to just genuflect to the history of science which is to say that that this is an idea also with engineering like if you think about the history of engineering it's 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 not coming from architects it's coming from laymen first and then it becomes theorized by architects and other groups so the point is that a lot of history of science is coming from the observations of ordinary people and then it's sort of then translated or theorized later by people in the academy and I'm just trying to sort of capture that within the field of infectious disease and epidemiology. Cool. Oh, Alan. 
Thanks, Jim. This is just a great talk, and um, I recommend that everybody actually read the book. It's Thank a you. Re remarkable book. But I do have a question because, <clears throat> as somebody who has studied disease mostly in the 20th century, but also looking back at the right. 19th century, there's often an attempt among physicians and public health people to make highly explicit. Um, observations that disease is different in different peoples. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you could study African-American people who are right. enslaved yeah. and make a generalization that right. this is the way this right. disease works right. contradicts in some way right. a lot of ideas That's about right. diseases of the Negro, diseases right. of Native populations. Right. Yeah. So I'm wondering in terms of building Right. epidemiology that very often it was the assumptions of difference that were crucial to these theories diseases of the poor yeah so so i'm wondering within your analysis how right. you account for race and racism right. ethnicity poverty in building the science of epidemiology it's this is why i think it's so fascinating because this is like one of the other findings in the book is that they're not deferring to race and, and identity as an explanatory factor. They are by all accounts white supremacists. So you could say they walk into, Milroy walks into one of these quote dilapidated Negro huts and he describes it using very sort of, we can understand negative language, um, but he's also describing it from the vantage point of sanitation. And he's describing the army camps the same way. And he's describing white people the same way. So like what becomes really fascinating is that they almost don't fall back on that kind of racial analysis. And what I'm really intrigued as a historian of race and medicine is when does that discourse of difference get deployed and when does it not get deployed? And it's not getting deployed in the British Sanitary Commission. Now, this is really important and lots of people misread this in the book and maybe I just need to explain it better, but I'll try to explain it better now. In the British Sanitary Commission, which is um, headed by Florence Nightingale, who's by all metrics, a white supremacist has all these ideas. She will make arguments about the design of the room. She'll make arguments, she'll need, she'll create her own rose graph to actually design and explain infection rates. She doesn't ever fall back entirely on the argument that it's a result of this particular group of people. She believes that white people are superior, but in the actual empirical evidence, it's not accounted for as a single category. The American Sanitary Commission develops a couple of years later, right after the British Sanitary Commission, directly inspired by Nightingale. They actually hijack it and start to add race in. And so what I explain in the book is that the doctors go into the post-war South and they start interviewing the men who were in charge of the auction houses. The doctors begin spying on black men black soldiers who are bathing and making comments about their body type. And then in the 19th, in the sanitary commission, you actually have a report that's called the physiological characters of the Negro. So they actually empirically create a brand new document to account for disease and difference. The British don't. So then people look at me and they say, oh, well, you're, you're missing it. The British are racist too. I say, I get that. But what's fascinating to me is the fact that the United States was fighting a war to end slavery to argue that race was a fictional concept, but science, on the other hand, was using its authority to codify race through the construction of the Sanitary Commission. The 18th century cases vary um, because they're not saying I mean, I know there's differences in pulmonary capacities and that comes out in the 19th century, but when they're arguing on this, these ships that the ventilators run better among Africans, they are not seeing it as different. So as a historian, I really have to be careful about context and about each episode 
because it's not universal. Um, but with, what's sad is that race then becomes codified as a marker after the Civil War as a result of the Sanitary Commission, building on the British Sanitary Commission, which doesn't, according to its records, um, tabulate race in the same way. Thank okay, yeah, thank much. you, thank you, yeah. So we're hearing about the, the Sanitary Commission, the British of the Crimean War, and the US Sanitary yeah. Commission or the Civil War, and we've heard about, among the categories up here, the incarcerated people, enslaved people, were a place of key role in this book as well. Yeah. Right, uh, both, both Crimean War and Civil War. Right. So speak more generally about the relationship between military and relationships they have in the epidemiology versus colonialism, imperialism. So what I, what I found was that when I, when I was working on the organization of the book, um, I had the chapter in the 1840s uh, for the Cape Verde, and then I had the chapter um, on Milroy and record keeping in the 1850s Jamaica. And then I wrote, I remember, I'll just never forget, it was like one of those summers where I thought, oh, I'm just going to knock out two chapters. <laughs> And I'm going to get to the Muslims at the end, and I'm like, I'm going to get to eat because the end is the International Sanitary Commission, where they're using the Mus the health conditions of Muslims in these various ports to determine whether or not cholera is contagious. And so I just wrote a sentence, and I just said, you know, building on the British Sanitary Commission. And I thought, how can I write building on the Brit? Like I actually have to now write a chapter on the Sanitary Commission. And so I decided because it was with. Harvard and it was with their trade division. I couldn't just give, um, I couldn't just give like a cyclopedic account of it. I had to make it as part of the argument. And then I wanted to use Nightingale as the main um, principal force, although I'd been derided and beat up every day since I gave a talk at Hopkins for doing this, but I'm going to stand by it. What I noticed was that the military bureaucracy that is being used by um, the army is then being used again by Nightingale. And then, so Nightingale is, so she reads in the newspaper about the alarming medical conditions in Crimea. And she writes that she'll go. And so she travels to Crimea and establishes a hospital. Um, and she notices that the French and the Russians are not suffering from massive morbidity and more soldiers are going into the hospital and dying than they are in the other in the other armies. So she develops this whole idea about um, ventilation. But when she returns home, she becomes really interested in statistics. And it's Prince Albert. She has a meeting with uh, the Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, whose status, who's being tutored by a statistician. And so she then becomes enamored by statistics and ultimately becomes the first woman to be inducted into the Royal Academy of Statisticians. She wants to continue doing the work. And so the reports are then actually sent to her from India. And so what I call that is the moment when knowledge production becomes disembodied. In other words, she no longer has to be on the ground collecting it in the same way that colonial doctors and other doctors were. So she becomes the first Fauci, like in terms of just, I do these little kind of jokes just to keep the audience. Okay. Uh, and so she, she starts collecting all of this material and um, she's able to witness what's happening in India and prescribe what they should do basically from her bed because she's becomes, she uh, developed some type of illness while she was in Crimea and she never leaves her bedroom. So what that became to me was really this interesting moment of military officials using the British um, the bureaucracy, which is incredibly fastidious to document the health conditions and then those reports flowing back to the Metropole. And I also just wanna say um, the reports uh, that quantify um, the number admitted to hospital, number who leave the hospital. They're the same reports that are used, the template in the American Civil War. They're the same reports that are used by, by the British government in Japan in 1870s and 1880s. Like literally these templates get developed and are deployed throughout the empires um, to track disease. And the military becomes the author of those reports. So, so I, I was going to as you said, uh, Nightingale is a, a, a very early prominent yes. epidemiologist. 
Would they give you a hard time about it at Hopkins? They no, the, my Hop, the Hopkins people didn't give me the the, the people. Jeremy Green, no, none, no, not Jeremy's my friend. <laughs> none of the Hopkins faculty gave up. the The audience gave me a hard time on Twitter, which you should never look at. You should never look at. <laughs> Who would rate your professor two o'clock in the morning? One too many Jack and Cokes. Don't go to rate your professor. Not worth it. Uh, don't read the reviews. Don't do any of this. They gave me a hard time because, in and it's not, but it's not. I'm very clear about this. It's not black historians. It's 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 certain white historians who feel that they need to call out racism in the past and they um, see Nightingale as a racist and they think that I'm um, promoting her. And I am a historian and I can't skip over people and I can't skip over what she did. And I didn't say Florence Nightingale, the patron saint of epidemiology. I just said, you know, like she's an un, she is an unrecognized unrecognized epidemiologist. I mean, this is the the point within nursing circles and and certain you know histories of statistics. She does appear, but she's often you know dismissed as the lady with the lamp. You know, and I I was really fascinated by the statistical work that she was doing, and it did contribute to these other ideas. So it becomes, you know, listen, we have to separate our social justice motivations from uncovering, from what we're doing in terms of uncovering the work in the past. Like we, there are ways of we treating the past. And as Drew Faust said, you know, the past is an uncomfortable place. Like with the recent, um, when her memoir came out, she was interviewed by someone and, and the quote went viral and she just said, it's uncomfortable. I'm like, you're going to find these moments. And she was my undergraduate teacher. So I still take pride in that. Um, and I, that's how I learned history, you know, from people like that. So, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I just had a question about your take, since you probably reviewed these uh, to a great extent, the studies, you know, your take on the robustness of the studies. I mean, if you are, um, you know, any clinical studies, you have to define the cohort and really look at um, all the different parameters that you're trying to make connections with and identify trends and so forth. Right. But if you are labeling population or your cohort as multitude of studies, um, you know, could you share a little bit about what you feel, how you feel that influences one's ability to really um, evaluate the robustness of the studies in general? So I would say that this is the, this is the moment, what I'm seeing is this is the moment when that reflex towards empirical language really begins to take hold. It's not to say that there weren't other quantitative studies that were done prior to that, but um, this is the birth of sort of a new medical branch of knowledge and the rise of social sciences is not yet happening. So the what I'm really interested in is like what are the antecedents to epidemiology and it's probably things like political arithmetic and the ways in which other forms of quanti quantification is developing as a result of as a result of census data and then even the slave trade so in other words they're not i mean i'm taking all of their studies with a grain of salt because it's it's just at the moment when that is being crystallized in lots of ways. And, and this is just a reminder to folks on the line that you can submit your questions via the Q&A. Um, can everyone hear okay? <laughs> yes. Um, so my question is about like the recent movement of a decolonization in global health. And, you know, I think for the past few years, we hear a lot of this um, decolonization movement. But um, if you look at the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, um, there's, all, there's an, definitely an inequity in the vaccine distribution. And also, you know, with, within the U.S., the Black maternal death is, you know, still a big issue. So um, what are your thoughts on this um, decolonization movement? Is it just a rhetoric or there are ways that we could do better to decolonize um, medicine or global health? 
Right. I mean, I, this is where I, I just, I, I would just say as a historian, I would hope that my work would contribute to the discussion to show how these fields developed. And one of the things I think about a lot is not, I, yes, to decolonizing the medicine. Um, one of the things I think about a lot is, you know, when there were interventions as early as the 1990s around multiculturalism, the, bur the burden was often on history departments and English departments, and the sciences were often removed from it. When I started to do this work on the history of ventilation and thinking about oxygen, I realized that these are not just these lily white enterprises that weren't marked by the history of slavery. And so to me, just being able to ground the fact that the history of chemistry is connected to the uh, transatlantic slave trade or the history of technology is connected to the transatlantic slave trade. I think that's my, my major contribution um, to those to those ideas, or at least I hope I hope it is. And to also just think about, I I, I on the weekends, I don't know if you do this, but I'll watch C-SPAN lectures or C-SPAN books. And, you know, there's still um, talks at major universities where you know, it's the story of Jon Snow. And I, I really don't mean to decanonize Jon Snow. I think Jon Snow is in, inherently important, but there's a context there. And I think understanding that context doesn't mean that we can't tell the story of Jon Snow. It actually just makes the story of Jon Snow, to me, a little bit more interesting. And it actually provides um, more nuance to the story, that this was it, that his investigative me methods were not just something that he dreamed up or happened by accident. They grew out of conversations that developed in the epidemiological society, which resulted from doctors deployed throughout the empire. So I would like that to be part of um, discussions in schools of public health and to, to sort of see it as, as important. I also am really interested too in not just marking the history or indexing the history of people of African descent as people who are victimized by medical racism, but I also am trying to accentuate the ways in which you see Black people who are providing care. And this is something that comes up in my teaching all the time. A lot of my students are really um, eager to show white doctors and white coats being awful to Black people. And I'm always like, yes, yes, and yes, we can use these examples when you find them. But let's not forget about the legions of Black nurses. Let's not forget about the legions of Black doctors. So some of this effort to like sort of go back in the past and to show a genealogy of medical racism obfuscates the work of Black healers, which were a central cornerstone in lots of Black communities. Lots of Black communities never saw a white doctor, never saw a white nurse. And so we have to be careful of, of, of that as well in terms of the decolonizing, because that's part of what this history is. And one of the great things about being at Harvard when I was here last year was that you have the National Medical Association records, which is there's the AMA, but the Black version is the NMA. And there's something that comes from and uh, actually opening it up and reading it and seeing those stories and seeing that history. Um, it's part of decolonizing medicine to really um, accentuate the principal role that Black people were playing throughout time in these, in these moments. Yeah, our ulterior motive is to keep you here. Doing more right. research. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, so, so we're talking about the reinterpretation of, of, of particular histories and it, it, earlier with Professor Nightingale. Um, when we first started the series, we originally had we had Margaret Humphreys here yeah. over a decade ago, and uh, you know, her work is fantastic. Sure, she's and, great, yeah. And you know, she's in Fosu. Yeah. Um, one person, uh, Ira Russell, comes out yeah. very different in, yeah. her, in her depiction of him versus in yeah. this book. I, if you want to just give some context. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm very indebted to. Uh, Margaret Humphreys, because she did an early study of the Sanitation Commission, and those records are voluminous. They could probably take up this room. And then the microfilm finding it at New York Public Library is not accurate. So she, I was emailing her, uh, and she was getting me the stuff. So I, I, my hat is off to her. I can't um, thank her enough. Um, she's much more sympathetic to one of the Sanitary Commission's uh, doctors, Ira Russell, who is really responsible for um, the work of the Sanitary Commission. When I read closer, more closely, um, 
I realized he was having conversations with slaveholders mm. and because he had this prurient fascination with race. And so I had to censor that. Mm -hmm. And um, he was responsible really for um, accentuating that race is a biological reality. Um, and, you know, I was very early on in my graduate training, I was trained by Barbara Fields, who wrote this amazing article about race and ideology. And she has a book called Racecraft, where she sort of says race is ideology. It's not just a construct. It's not this. And one of the things that she says is that the only way that race can continue is because we continue to invest in it. And whether we continue to invest in it because we're trying to help Black people or we're trying to we're continue to invest in it because we want to hurt Black people, it's the continuation that actually propagates this idea and keeps races alive. And so that was my reason for pushing back against um, I.R. Russell because what, as, at the moment when Congress is saying black people can vote, a doctor is saying a black person's different right. and is using the power of the federal government to use science to codify that difference. It could have gone a completely different way if that didn't happen, because that, when you think, I mean, I think, because I think about this a lot, like, if you really think about within a couple of years, men who were born enslaved could vote and could be elected to office. I mean, that's a revolution that was happening in this country. And yet science was propagating this idea of difference. I mean, that's, that's, and he was, he was one of those who did it. And um, that's, that's why I, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling the whole story. Uh, is is the point? Yeah. Great. So I, I think. Well, oh, Joan, I'll they hand off to you. <laughs> Dude, thank you very much. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I I, I just want to say thank you so very much. Um, when we have these sessions, I have to admit I walk away with more questions, um, and and um, not with confusion, but with this real sense. Um, that we don't know the rest of the story, that only part of the story is told. Um, so some of my thoughts, as you said this, about this observations of ordinary people, and that's part, that's medicine and science, it's observations, and we take it up to theory, but then the ways in which those observations get lost. And then you talked about this bureaucracy and this, this allowing quantification and documentation and the, these data but then not having the stories and the work behind it. So you just have those figures struck by that. And also struck by the ways in which um, we're not clear about where and how and when is knowledge generated. Um, and I think about us being in these classrooms and these spaces and saying, oh my gosh, this is just brilliant. And not stepping back and saying like, is it really? And, and, and what is the thinking behind this and what were the assumptions and the basis for those assumptions. And then I come back to just really basic things. Who is and who is not in the story? Who is and who is not in the room in deciding what gets, what is and is not important and who is and who is not included on multiple levels. And I thank you for creating the space for us to think about that to push us um, to not just examine history, um, because I think of history as being created today. And how are we telling our story today? And how are we thinking about this inclusion and exclusion and these kinds of issues today as we're conducting our science? Um, and then this last part where you said that through Faust, uh, the past is um, being, as being uncomfortable and it should be. Um, but I think so much of what we should we talk about, we should be uncomfortable. Um, uh, that the, what, what is truth in all of this um, space? But I thank you for raising it because there, with these assumptions and the past that has been had, handed down, there are so many ways when so many of us have been left out of that past. Our contributions have been left out and the story left, is left untold. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you to the History of Medicine, Global Health, and Social Medicine, and the Center for Bioethics on partnering.
and thank you for being with us. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.